time I spend with Jesus Sweet is the presence of the Lord And sweet is the way He gently takes me by the hand And helps me down the road that leads to home Hello everyone, what a great privilege it is to be able to come into your home and to share the Word of God with you. Uh, I don't know what uh, has caused you to tune into this channel at this moment, at this time, but I believe with all of my heart that there are people that will probably be watching this program today who have deep abiding needs, who have needs for health, uh, who have financial needs, who have family needs, have relationship needs. Uh, maybe there's a Christian out there that you're discouraged, you're defeated, uh, you've stopped serving God for whatever reason. Or maybe there's a person here you have never, ever really come to the point where you have committed your life to Jesus Christ. Uh, we're here today to try to help. We're not here to hurt. We're here to try to help you understand God's will and God's plan for your life. And if you're, uh, if you're watching, and if you look real closely, uh, and you've never seen the inside of a TV studio, you may be able to look at the reflection off the top of my head and see the camera there in front of us. Uh, I look just like my dad, and uh, I've got a boy that's going to look just like me. So bald heads, I believe, are a sign of great intellect, and I think everybody would agree with that. I want to uh, read a passage of Scripture from uh, the first chapter of Paul's writings to Colossians. Uh, of course, uh, Colossians is one of what is called the prison epistles. Uh, this was written by Paul, a letter back to the church at Colossae, uh, because they were having some problems in the church. And I'm going to start reading with verse 16 and read through verse 23. This is the Word of God, and we want you to listen to it carefully. Uh, talking about Jesus, Paul says, For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. That's very important. Verse 17, he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, now here's the title of my message to you today, that in all things he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet has he now reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Can we pray just for a moment? Uh, Heavenly Father, we just come to you today, uh, God, with a realization deep within our inner being that you are the God of all gods, that you are the creator, you are the sustainer of life. And Father, we thank you that we have this privilege today to uh, share the Word of God with folks that might be listening, uh, God who may be uh, faced with a terrible decision in their life, uh, may be faced with a, a very rocky road on their path. Father, we just pray that today something might be said, God, that uh, something might come from your Word that would touch a heart and help folks to know how much you love and care for them. So we give these moments to you, and we ask that Jesus Christ receive the praise. In his name we ask it. Amen. Again, we go back up to verse 18. The theme is today the preeminence of Christ. Paul writes, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning 
the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. You know, this text in Colossians is one of the high points of the Bible. It's one of those verses, one of those passages that tells us about the, the God of glory, the God who created us and made us. Uh, it's one of the clearest proclamations in all of the Bible about the deity of Christ. Jesus is God, God in the flesh. And if I had one sermon, if someone came to me and said, Mike, you've got one sermon to preach, and after that you can't preach anymore, I would preach on the preeminence of Christ. Many of you know that I like to sing. Uh, and uh, if I had someone came to me and said, Mike, you've got one song to sing, uh, I, would, I would sing about the preeminence of Christ. If someone came to me and said, Mike, you can only write one more song and you can't write any more songs, uh, then I would write a song about the preeminence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And let me tell you why this is so important, folks. If you are wrong about the doctrine of Christ in your life, nothing else you believe will be right. You understand that? Every, the central uh, theme of the Bible is Jesus Christ and his shed blood. From Genesis to Revelation, uh, the Bible tells us this one theme, the blood atonement, that through Jesus Christ, man would be saved through his shed blood. Uh, Colossae, of which uh, Paul is writing this letter, was a city in a Roman province of Asia today. That area is known as modern Turkey. Uh, and several years after this church was founded by a man named Epaphras, uh, a serious heresy developed in that church congregation that threatened its very existence. And the heresy later came to be known as Gnosticism. And if you study the Bible enough, you'll find out that Gnosticism uh, was one of the most dangerous false doctrines. And most of the epistles in the New Testament were, were written to refute some form of this ungodly doctrine. One of its uh, teachings was that Jesus was just one of many spiritual beings that were descended from God. And since Jesus was less than God, he could not be God. Uh, they also taught that they had a higher revelation of God than anyone else. And this is where uh, Gnosticism has made a resurgence in the last hundred years in the churches uh, in the Western world uh, with this teaching that someone might say, well, I have a higher understanding of God than you do. I have a higher revelation from God of his will for man than you do. Uh, they also taught that Jesus didn't have a real human body, but he was a spirit, and when he walked on the sand, he didn't leave any footprints. Well, Epaphras, who was the pastor of this church, was so concerned about this false teaching that he made the long journey from Colossae to Rome, uh, where Paul was a prisoner there, and Paul's response to this problem that Epaphras What's having in his church back in Colossae is what we call the epistle of Colossians. Now, it is, it is of extreme importance, my friends, to have a well-laid foundation in our lives as to who Jesus is. If we lose the clearness, uh, if we lose the clearness of the nature and the person of the Lord Jesus, we will lose our connection with the head of the church, we will, we will just simply uh, miss his transforming power. That's, that's what the church is here for, uh, that we might preach the gospel and people's lives would be dramatically changed and transformed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you will end up, if you, if you are mistaken about the person of Jesus Christ and that he is God, he is God incarnate, uh, if you miss that, uh, then the gospel that you preach is going to be empty, it's going to be powerless, and it's not going to have any meaning. Uh, you will not have the gospel that is written in the Bible, but you will have a dead religion. One of the things that I'd like to say to you, and, uh, and people, some people will not understand this if you don't really have a good foundation in the Scripture, but the most hated man in the world today is Jesus Christ. 
Now, I'm not talking about the Jesus that people make up in their minds. I'm talking about the Jesus that is revealed in Scripture, where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That's very, very exclusionary. That means that he is the only one that can forgive us of sin, that can give our life meaning, and that can take us to heaven when we die. So let me ask you a question. What is your image of Christ? What is it that you believe about Jesus? In 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, verse 4, Paul says that it's possible to preach another Jesus than the one that uh, God had revealed to him and the other apostles and to the Jesus that was being revealed throughout the New Testament. Today, what happens is people, they want to shape their own version of Jesus. They want to have their own idea of who Christ is. Uh, if I tread on some toes here, uh, good, because we all need to have our toes treaded on every once in a while. Uh, there is the right-wing Republican Jesus, but there's also the left-wing liberal Democrat Jesus. Uh, there's the gay rights Jesus. There's the gay bashing Jesus. Uh, there's the downtrodden, powerless poverty Jesus. Uh, there's the wealthy uh, Rolls Royce driving prosperity Jesus. There's the holly jolly Santa Claus Jesus who gives everything to everybody that they've always wanted. Uh, there is the miracle a minute uh, Holy Ghost power anointing Jesus. There's the uptight teetotaling King James only fundamentalist Jesus. There's the robe wearing Open and affirming Jesus who hugs everyone and says, good, good for you. There's the tattooed indie rock goth Jesus. There is the eyebrow waxing metrosexual Jesus. And if you don't know what that is, come down to St. Louis sometime and I'll tell you what it's all about. There's the gun-toting NRA redneck NASCAR Jesus. There's the white collar uh, tie-wearing, institutionalized Jesus. There's the blue-collar, hammer-swinging, Copenhagen-chewing union member Jesus. And then there's the WWJD bracelet-wearing, Christian t-shirt Jesus who only listens to Spirit 105 contemporary radio. I mean, there's all kinds of ideas of who Jesus is out there. Some even said in the Bible that he was a demon-possessed Jesus. Uh, some said that he was a, a glutton and a drunkard Jesus. Uh, many say, even today, that he's a prophet. Even within uh, the uh, uh, religion of Islam, the Muslim faith, Jesus is considered a prophet, but he's just considered one of many prophets. Uh, some said he is a moral teacher and a good man, but he's not God. That's taught very, very much in many churches today. It certainly is predominant in most of the seminaries in our country. Uh, some said that he is a healer and a miracle worker. Yes, he's that. Uh, so, some say he is the incarnation of one of the millions of Hindu gods. And some say that he is an expression of the Buddha. So there's all kinds of ideas about who Jesus is. You may have to make sure the Jesus of the Bible is the Jesus that you hang on to, that it's the Jesus that you believe. In Matthew 16, 15, Jesus asked his disciples, but who do you say that I am? That's very important. You have to come to a point where you believe for yourself. There has to come a point in your life uh, when you don't have your mother and dad's religion or grandpa and grandma's religion, but there has to come a time when you have to decide for yourself who Christ is. You have to answer that question. It's the age-old question. Who is Jesus? Well, let me tell you what Paul says here in Colossians. And this is such a thrill to be able to say this to you. He is the image of the invisible God. Jesus is the perfect reflected image of the invisible God. He is the exact likeness of God. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Now, if you were to go to Rome and you were to go to a place called the Raspi Lagosi Palace in Rome, there's a famous fresco there by an artist by the name of Guido Rene, and it's entitled the Aurora. Now, it's considered to be 
the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful works of art ever created by man. It's painted on a very, very high ceiling. And as people would come and they would stand and they would look at, up at it, their necks would get stiff and they would get dizzy. So the man that owned that palace uh, placed a large round mirror on the floor. So now you can just sit down around the edge of that mirror and by looking in the mirror you can study the beauty of this fresco in comfort and not get a stiff neck. Well, let me tell you something. Jesus is that. He's the exact mirror image of deity. He is the express image of God's person. In Jesus, God becomes visible and intelligible to you. God has stooped down to our level, and though man is feeble, he can get his hands on the reality of God. Uh, I've had people through the years say to me, well, uh, you know, how can I get to know God? How can I know God? How can I make him part of my life? Well, my friends, the answer is found in the book of books. It's found in the Bible. Uh, get a hold of a, a Bible and begin to read it. Uh, call on someone that you know that is a Christian and uh, knows the Bible and have them sit down with you and teach you about the Christ of the Bible. Uh, Jesus said to you and I, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. And the way you do that is by opening up the Bible. I tell you what, the Bible has revolutionized my life. I tell you what, the Bible at one time uh, saved me from absolute destruction as a person. It was the Word of God. It was the power of God. It was the Christ of Calvary. Now, here's what Paul does. He begins to move the proclamation of the eternal Christ, and he begins to move it to a higher level and his words come to us uh, as a, a refreshing water. To If you have a dry heart and a thirsty heart, the words of Paul come to us uh, with great living water. If you are truly hungry to, for God, listen to me. Now listen to me. I'm nothing. I understand that. I am absolutely nothing. Uh, but I do know the message of the word of God, and I want to give it to you. The Bible teaches us here in this passage in Colossians that God created all things in heaven and on earth of the cosmos. Uh, Paul speaks here in this passage of angelic dignities. Uh, he talks about thrones, principalities, uh, dominions, and powers. Uh, all of these are different references uh, to various categories of angels whom Christ created and whom Jesus rules over. Now listen to me, folks. It makes no difference if the angels that are referred to here are holy. It makes no difference if the angels referred to here are fallen. Jesus Christ is the Lord of both. Though Jesus is the most hated man in the world, why? Well, the Bible teaches us because men love darkness rather than light. Uh, the reason that the Jewish leaders in the time of Jesus' passion crucified him was mainly because he pointed out their sin. And you and I, we're human beings. We don't like to have our wrong pointed out to us. That's why many men and women and young people do not come to Christ today. Now, that's why many people are evolutionists. is because they feel like then they don't have to be responsible to a holy God. But as God, Jesus created the material and the spiritual uh, universe for his own pleasure and glory. Uh, the material, this is something to think about, the material world was actually created by the spiritual world. Uh, verse 17 tells us that he is before all things and by him all things consist. You know what that means? That means that according to the word of God, Jesus Christ is the glue. He is the glue that keeps the world together. By him, all things consist. He literally holds the universe together. Uh, it is Christ who sustains the universe. It is Christ uh, who, through natural laws, uh, keeps the planets in place and the stars in place. It is Christ who keeps the balance necessary for life to exist and continue here on, on the earth. But let me tell you something else. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is in you.
if you are a believer. One of the greatest things, one of the greatest mysteries that Paul revealed was Christ in you, the hope of glory. This was, this was not taught in the Old Testament fully. Uh, it was hinted at in the Old Testament. But it was a mystery, the Scripture says. But now, uh, through this man that God had saved and called to the ministry, now he reveals this mystery, and it's this, that God has come into the world through a person. And through that person, Jesus Christ, the preeminent person of all of history, through that man and through his death upon the cross, he has made it possible for every man to have forgiveness of sin. Now you have to humble yourself. Uh, one of the things that disturbs me about uh, modern Christianity, and particularly here in the States, uh, is the de-emphasis of repentance. Uh, if you're going to come to Christ, you need to repent of your sin. Now, you, the Bible nowhere teaches uh, that you are going to be able to throw off all at once all of the weaknesses and frailty of the flesh. The Bible teaches sanctification. I believe it teaches progressive sanctification. But if you come to Christ, there should be a change in your life. You, would, you should be seeking after God. There, you shouldn't be the same person. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Let me tell you briefly about a man that, uh, that I uh, came to know down in St. Louis when I was pastor there. Uh, me and a couple of young men went out to go witness and uh, try to find souls that we could talk to about the gospel. So we just went out on the streets down around St. Charles Rock Road. And while we were out there, we saw a bunch of men in a backyard. So we stopped, and I had a handful of tracks, and uh, the three of us walked up into this backyard. And in a very quick way, we realized that most of these men were homeless men. Uh, and one of the homeless men, that was his mother's house, and it was her backyard that they were in. And she was letting them sleep in the garage and a couple of other buildings there on her property. There was a man there uh, who didn't look like he belonged there. Uh, he was an elderly gentleman, uh, and uh, I found out later his name was Ray Andrews. Ray was retired from McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis, uh, and uh, his connection with these men was that he would uh, go get food for them, he would take them to doctor's appointments, and he would help them in any way that he could. Well, the upshot of it was I sat there with Ray and some other men and began to talk to them about the Lord, and I just talked to them about 10 minutes, and finally I said, is there anybody here that would like to know more? Well, the three men that were there, uh, three of them said, no, nah, we're not interested, and they turned and walked away. But Ray was sitting in a lawn chair there, and he said, well, I'd like to know more. And so I pulled my chair, chair over next to him and uh, I began to talk to him, found out that he had been divorced for a number of years, that he had three grown daughters. He was 76 years old. Uh, and uh, he was estranged from his daughters. They didn't want anything to do with him. I found out that Ray had led his life pretty loosely uh, and at one time had been a heavy drinker, though that wasn't true at the time I met him. And as I began to talk to him about the things of Christ, I could tell that Ray's heart was being moved by the scripture. And so I spent about 45 minutes talking with him. And after I had talked with him for that length of time, I looked over at him, he had beautiful white hair. I was kind of jealous of him for that. In fact, right at this stage in my life, I'd settle for any hair, blue, green, yellow, purple. But he had beautiful white hair. And uh, there I asked him, I said, Ray, do you understand what I've said to you? He said, oh, yes, I understand. I said, do you understand about your sin? He said, yes. I, I, he says, I've been a terrible man. He said, my girls won't even hardly have anything to do with me. He said, I, I ruined my marriage. And I said, uh, well, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? He said, well, you've showed me from the Bible he said, uh, though I've never read the Bible, uh, I have respect for it. And if you uh, say that that's in the Bible and I have read it for myself, yes, I, I believe Jesus died for me. And the upshot of it was there in that backyard, that old gentleman bowed his head and he prayed. I didn't lead him in a prayer. I just said, Ray, you need to pray. And I ask you to pray out loud. Oh, I've never prayed, Mike. I said, don't worry about it. 
God's not worried about uh, the words you use. What he's worried about, what he's concerned about is the attitude of your heart. And there that old man began to confess his sin. He's wrong. And he started weeping and crying. I reached over and took him by the hand. And when he finished praying and inviting Christ into his life, I prayed for him and prayed that God would help him. Well, let me tell you, after I'd gone through some scriptures in 1 John about assurance, how to know that you're saved, you know, God wants you to know that you're saved. <laughs> you don't want a, a hope so re, uh, faith in Christ or a maybe faith in Christ. You want to have a no so faith in Christ. God wants you to have that. And after I, he had received an assurance of his salvation, I talked to him about uh, making his public profession of faith in Christ and following God and getting in the church and helping us and serving the Lord the rest of his life. He was very, very sick, had COPD, had heart trouble, had all, took 30 pills a day. Finally, after we'd finished, he leaned back in his chair and he crossed his arms like this. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor Mike, I'm 76 years old. How come I've never heard about this before? And I said, well, Ray, I'm ashamed to tell you that very few Christians in these days uh, make any attempt at all to witness to other people about the love of Christ. That old man came to church the next Sunday, walked that aisle, gave his heart to Christ, was baptized a couple of weeks later. He lived a year and a half after he had come to Christ. In the hospital room as Ray Andrews lay dying, his daughters were around the bed because he had reached out to them and they had reconciled. His ex-wife was in the room and he had apologized to her for the horrible life that he had caused her to live. And there as he got, was almost slipping into a coma, he took me by the hand and we prayed together. And he looked over at me and he said, Pastor Mike, thank you for coming by that day and telling me about Jesus. A few hours later, he went into a coma that he never recovered from, and he passed away and is in heaven today, I believe, because of his faith in the preeminent Christ. Jesus Christ is a preem preeminent person of all of human history. And folks, let me tell you, it may seem like today that he's losing, but go to the end of the Bible and read it. And you'll find out that he wins big time. Thank you very much for this privilege of being in your home. I invite you to come and visit with us at the First Baptist Revival Prayer Center. We'd be available to you anytime. And may God bless you and keep you is my prayer in Jesus' name. And sweet is the way.